But we are in the lucky pot where there is a crock pot out in the foyer that you drop things in, and I pick one out each week and kind of go off. And the one that I picked this week is one that's been in there multiple, multiple times, and we'll get into it in a minute. But I have a discussion topic for you with your neighbor. And so we're going to think small groupish because there is a smaller group of us this morning. And then I'm going to write some things on the board. And we are... Um, you just consider me Professor Eberlein rather than Pastor Eberlein this morning because you're going to have to use your thinking cap this morning. So those of you that like to think when you come here, this will be great. Yes, saw Vander Linden put her thinking cap on back there. That was good work. Uh, for those of you that want something a little more uh, devotional and um, less, less thoughtful, then you'll have to wait for a few weeks because we'll get there, but we have to set up some foundational things and some building blocks before we can get there. It's kind of like when you, you want to build a Lego house. Like the one week I had the Legos up here and I took away the bottom piece and didn't tell the person that I was taking it away and it made it hard to put it all together. We have to do some of that this week. And so uh, get cozy with your neighbor or the people around you. And here is the question that I have for you. And I'll give some specificity as we start talking about it. What are the things that you let have authority in your life? What are the things that you let have authority in your life? And I'll give you some general categories, though this isn't all of them. Uh, rules and laws, like the stop sign, you pull up to it, and that tells you stop, and you go, yes. Some of you say no, or maybe you did when you were younger, uh, but you know that that says stop, and so you let it have the authority to tell you to stop. So there are some rules and some laws and some things like that. That's one area. Another area would be um, more in the line of ideas and maybe some partial rules. So you could think of... Um, CP, was it... You did the physics one where you held the ball up. Was everybody here to hear physics from CP? Like, stand there and the law of physics says that if I drop this over here and you stand right there, it's going to hit you in the face. You can stand there and say, no, that does not have authority on my life and let it hit you in the face. Or you can move. Uh, so there's some of those things. Sorry, I'm, I have an illness in my throat this morning that just made this ear hole close. It's not helping. Uh, and then there are other things like preferences or social media or friends and family. You let them have influence in your life and authority. Like your dad says, don't do that, and you choose to not do it, or you choose to do it a little bit more and then stop. Like, you know what I'm getting at. So turn to your neighbor, and that doesn't mean that you have to pick just those. Any number of things, we're going to write them all up on the board so that we can get them all out. And then we're going to dig in just a little bit. So go ahead, talk to your neighbor. I'll give you at least a minute and 28 seconds, if not more. So don't just shuffle through really fast. What are things in your life that you give authority to? Ready, set, go.
How you doing? You need a little more time? No? I see Alyssa over here. The baby was making you yawn. That was a big one. You ready to do this? Okay, tell me what your neighbor said. What has authority, in, or it can be yours, and it can be things you thought of just now or, or otherwise. CP, I'm going to move this just for a second. The calendar. Oh, yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can't go that fast. Is calendar E N? Lynn Dar. Uh, the clock. What else? Work. Work. Technology. Technology has authority in your life. Family. Illnesses? Thank you. The left side ear is still not open yet. The B I B L E. Who said that? <laughs> oh. That was the Vanderlyn and child that put her thinking cap on. <laughs> uh, Mr. Blank is four, was that you? What did you say? Ah, oh, yes, kids. Weather. <laughs> so what do you want me to write on the board, brother? <laughs> I'm choosing not to ignore you. What would you like me to put on the board? <laughs> Less with age. What else? Oh, yes. Society. And I'm going to just add some in here that I'm assuming you thought of is um, from society you get social media and media for those of you that are not social and you just let it tell you uh, and within that yes politics I think that's spelled right this is really testing me what else <laughs> That's politics. <laughs> Comfort. Oh, yeah. The rumble. 
this is a tangent, but this one has been around for a long time. Paul says, the stomach for food and food for the stomach, so you should just eat whatever you want as he has a struggle with a church. Night and day. I'm going to put that here. Oh, you guys are really rattling them off. Meant all health. Okay, so before I go any further, why do you let them have authority in your life? Does anybody have a thought? Consequences? Consequences? Yeah. What happened? There have been some children using my markers. That one got smashed. I don't know how to spell consequences. <laughs> C-O-N-S-E-Q-U-E-N-C-E-S. See, I did know. It's just like a spelling bee up here. Consequences. What else? Necessity. You have to explain that more. You don't have to. <laughs> you could teach them from home. You could teach them from home. Go to the gym. Okay. Um, Yes. <laughs> Peace and calmness. Uh, let, let me give you some categories. Either things are, okay, you follow me? That's, it is. It is that way. Gravity. You go ahead and choose to not. Doesn't work very well. Right? It just is. Or you choose it. Now here's the thing. Both of those do have consequences and responsibilities that are tied in with them. Right? So your choice is your choice, and the thing that you choose has consequences or repercussions or good things that happen from that. Your choice to get up and go to the gym early in the morning is that yesterday, Kish, Carrie told him, you can't be lazy and be a bum all day long. You have to go downstairs and work out for 30 minutes, and he came upstairs. He's like, I didn't really want to, but oh, that feels good now, but I don't want to do anymore. <laughs> the consequence was he felt better. That there are some good consequences too. Consequences aren't always bad, but it, there's a choice involved here. Now, I'm going to take you back about 2,400 years, okay? There was. Let me find that thing. There, uh, so you've all heard of this guy named Socrates. Well, he didn't write anything down. He had a student of his that was name was Plato. And Plato wrote all these things down, not Plato, like the stuff you play, but Plato. And, and what he said was, we've talked about this previously, I say apple. I can't draw an apple very good. That just looks inappropriate. I have to erase that. I say fruit. I say cherry. Cherry. Cherry, I can draw a cherry. Now you think of cherry, did you think of Marciano cherry? Did you think of the kind of greenish red cherries? I don't know the vernacular of cherries like I do apples. Should have stuck with apples. Uh, let's make this into an apple. We'll just call it apple. Forget the things I said before. This is an apple. So 
I say apple, and Plato says, you see something in your head because way up here is an idea. Ooh, <laughs> can't spell idea. <laughs> of an apple. That there is something otherworldly that gives you apple. Okay, so here's, here's perfect. You think of the word perfect and you kind of think you know what it is, but how do you know? How do you know there's perfect? It's just a word. Because something up other tells you that. Okay, you following me? I need some nods of yes, otherwise I'm going to keep going here. You guys on YouTube, you're just going to have to rewind. Now, uh, this was Plato. He had a student named Aristotle. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is the one that helped give you the Greek language in which the New Testament is written. Aristotle said, um, Apple, Apple, let me find a different color. You looked around and you saw Red Delicious, you saw Brayburn, you saw Honeycrisp, you saw Granny Smith, you saw apples, and what you did was bring them all together so that you chose apple. Here's the difference. There's no idea of an apple that exists out there. There's only what you can see and what you begin to categorize. If you're a church historian, this is Augustine. This is Thomas Aquinas and how you get, this is my body. The bread looks like bread, but its essence that we categorize in is Christ's body. You don't have to know that for today. Are you following me here? I'm getting less nods of yes. So you walk around, and you see multiple things, and you decide, book. Doesn't mean that it's paperback. Doesn't mean that it's Kindle. Doesn't mean that it's hardcover. Doesn't mean that it's a big book, a small book, a, a large print book, any of those things. But you have this thing in your head, book, because it was already there or because you looked around and you made that category. Okay, you following me? Here's why this matters. The B-I-B-L-E. It's a bunch of books. It's really not a single book. It's more like a library. Of books put together. And it has authority in your life. A. Because it does. B. Because you chose to let it have that authority. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Not as many yeses. Um, this is way out there. The Bible says every Thursday you stand on one foot and you go, It's kind of ridiculous, but there's actually religions where there are certain postures and poses. In the Hebrew religion, the way that they pray is like this. Kavanah. You know who wails at the wailing wall? Not non-Hebrew people because they wail. Everybody else goes, oh, look at those guys yelling. No, they really mean it. So, either the Bible is, let's say, truthful or authoritative in your life because it is. Now, you take the philosophy aside and you could say because God made it that way. Or, because you choose to let it. Follow me? 
I'm not getting as many yeses. Okay, you're going to have to go back and rewind because we're already 20 minutes in. Here's what I want to do now. Save that. If you're in a small group, you're going to talk about some of these things, not the Plato and Aristotle. You can look that up later or ask me questions. Here is, um, CP actually sent me this this week. Um, one of the great philosophers, Kierkegaard, you don't have to know him, says, uh, here's the paraphrase. The Bible, God wants you to understand it. But deep down inside, you wish he didn't. So, we say, well, that one doesn't make sense to me. Nah, not there. I don't get that. Why does that in there? No, that's not for today. Rather than saying God's word is God's word, it comes from him and it has authority in my life. Here's the reason that we're talking about that. Over all of the iterations of the lucky pot, there has been a question regarding sexuality. We will talk about that over the next few weeks. We won't get into it deeply today, but what you have to know before you start is when you read the Bible, does it say something to you because it does, or does it say something to you because you let it? Here's the two different choices. And, and this will show my bias. Either God tells you from the throne something, or you take him off, you sit in his place, and you say, I'll decide. Does that make a little more sense now? I'm going to pray, and then we're going to read through a little bit of Romans 1. Not all of it, just a little bit, and then we're going to take a little journey back in time. Spirit, I ask that as we move into a discussion, a topic, um, an area that is absolutely a struggle for many, and some it's not a struggle and it should be, and for others we know exactly what we believe, but we don't even know why, I pray that you would bring clarity. I pray that you would bring enlightenment. I pray that you would demystify some things that we think are too hard for us to understand and that through it all you would truly be glorified in the things that we think, the things that we do, and the things that we try to live up to. So Spirit, I pray that you would come and clear out the craziness from the day, the cold, the wind, the whatever's after this, the playoff games, and I pray that you would help us to listen and understand. In your powerful name, amen. Here's one thing I will say. The lucky pot, as far as topics, is now closed until we get to summertime, because we're going to get into February with this. What I will do is, if you have questions regarding this topic, put them in there, and if I can address them as we go through the next few weeks. I will tell you right now, we will talk about things like marriage, homosexuality, divorce, and singleness. All of those things will be covered to varying degrees because we are not going to just pay attention to one at the forsaking of all the others. This is all. And here's why. Romans 1.16. This is Paul writing to the Roman church. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it has power. Whose gospel is it? God's gospel. Here's where uh, Paul would fall in line with Plato, that God is the ultimate perfection and gives these things to us, and it has power. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that by faith, from first to last, by faith. Now, we talked a little bit about righteousness just last week in the aspect that there are acts of righteousness, but they are carried through by faith. What he's trying to do is let the Jewish people that continually tried to do the right things for the sake of doing the right things because they were told to do the right things, let them know that it's not just about doing 
the right things. That faith is the thing that pushes this through. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Right off the bat, he lets them know power. The gospel has power. If you miss that, the rest of the book doesn't make sense. Because anything that he tells you, you have to understand that God's power can do what God's power can do. Which means anything. Verse 18. Now the wrath of God, now we get into it. He started with the power to let you know that the gospel is the power to salvation. You have to begin with that before you understand that this isn't about do's and don'ts right away. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. All of the godlessness, all of the wickedness. Not just the things we pick and choose. Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Suppress it. Push it down. Uh, if you're a hunter, there's a reason that they don't like silencers because it suppresses the sound and people won't know. And it's just I'm not getting into that debate. I could have put that on the other side of the board, whether you have amendments or you don't have amendments. Prohibition or not prohibition. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because he has made it plain to them. So you have to just look at that verse again. The wrath of God is revealed because he made it plain. What he desired he made plain of all things. And here's where it really gets into it. For since the creation of the world... I'll just let that linger for a second. Paul doesn't say, because the Ten Commandments said so. Paul doesn't say, in Leviticus it says, in Malachi it says, in Isaiah it says, or it is written. He says, since before there was light, before there was dirt, before there were fish in the sea, birds in the air, God chose for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, being understood through His creation, so that people are without excuse. All people. Now here's where we're going to jump backwards. Genesis 1. You don't have to work real hard if you're looking at one of the Bibles. You just flip to the beginning. In the beginning, God. There should be a massive period right there. In the beginning, the Genesis, there was nothing but God. In the beginning, God. Exclamation point. God was. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. A couple questions from the Lucky Pot that I won't get into deep here is um, was there water before creation? Well, it says that God created the heavens and the earth. He doesn't give it specificity yet so there was water innate in that and His Spirit was working in it because He created it. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that light, and it was good. And he separated the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. One of the other questions from the Lucky Pot was, if a day in God's mind is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, so does this mean a day or does it not? And we're not going to take a whole lot of time to jump into creationism and evolution and all that stuff. But the Bible wants to let you know there was evening and there was morning. Day one. So you should hear day. Okay? How that all works, we don't know because let's just get it out of the way. This is not a science textbook nor manual. They didn't have any of that jargon. This is written more in the form of poetry through stories that have been carried along through the generations. 
I'm going to skip ahead and I just put, you can put the other one up there, Tim. So I'm not going to read through all of the creation account. You see light and darkness, day and night, evening and morning. This is why the Hebrews, their day starts at evening and goes into the next day. Rather than the sun comes up, it's a new day. Uh, which gets into things that you think about with the resurrection and the three days and all of that stuff for another topic. Sky and sea on the second day. It was really the waters and then the waters above because they believed that there was something above that was waters and not the reflection of the sea that made it blue and all of that stuff. They didn't know science the way that we do, so you can't read it exactly the same way. Land and vegetation, the firmament and the things that grew upon it, the sun and the moon, the, the lights to govern the day, to govern the night, birds of the sky, creatures of the sea, on the sixth day, we get animals, and he gives specificity of domestic animals, wild animals, and the creepy crawly things upon the ground, and then humans. And then he zooms in, and here's where we're going to go, verse 26. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image. And now I'll say that the common practice in Near Eastern studies and Near Eastern religions and the way that they told stories was any deity was a royal we. Now we could read the Trinity within this us, uh, which is there, but the original intent from the Hebrews was literally that God was other. That you didn't have the right to refer to yourself as a we because you were not holier than us. And, and outside of all things. So here we find uh, the us language. Let us make mankind, humankind, in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over all of the livestock, all of the wild animals, and over all of the creatures that move along the ground. There is one thing that you have to think critically about when you approach this. You have the garden scene. He's creating man and woman. We don't get into that specific, specifically of the two genders until Genesis 2. But what you have is anytime there's a temple, think uh, Artemis, Zeus, Baal, Molech, whatever, what is inside that temple? An image of whoever's temple it is, right? Right? Now let us make mankind in our image. God implanted his representation within that first creation in you. That is way better than a rock, a statue, or a golden calf. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky over every living creature that moves upon the ground. You should notice he's repeated this a number of times. Rule over them. On the sixth day, he creates all the stuff, animals, and the one that will rule over it, humanity. And then he zooms in and says, here you are, my special people. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. Side tangent. That tells me that the, the one forbidden fruit scientifically was not a fruit because it had no seeds. Go ahead and put that in your brain buster category. It says all of the seed stuff you can have. That one must not have had seeds. Um, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, all the birds in the sky, all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food and it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. Now, Tim, why don't you go back to the one that had the, the separations of the days. Here's, here's what I want to draw your attention to just very generally and basically. As you go throughout creation, you see heavens, earth, sky, sea, 
Air creatures, sea creatures, animals, humanity, within humanity, male, female. There is, um, I think this is a good phrase, a dichotomy, a separation, two things separated out, of complementarity, that they go together. The sun and the moon. If I give you a compliment, you go, oh, that's me to you. There is a connection there, but they are separate. That they balance the equation of each one. Do you follow what I'm saying there? If you don't, then you need to look up the words dichotomy and complementarity. If you don't understand that, put it in the bucket and I'll explain it more so. One to the other. Land, vegetation, birds, sea creatures, male, female, sun, moon, one and the other, meant for each other in a way that is a balance. Okay? If we were a uh, Taoist or uh, of a far, far, far Eastern religion, we would talk about yin and yang and all that sort of thing, that there is something innate within the creation that has one and its other. Following me? Back to Romans 1. We left Genesis where Paul begins his cre creation account saying, we are all without excuse because it's laid in the foundations of the world. Not in the rules, not in the laws, but in the foundation of the world, the fiber that knits us together. Romans 21, chapter 1. For although, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Remember what God told to the people that he created in the beginning. Rule over these things. The birds, the fish, the livestock, the other animals, and the creepy crawly things. And Paul says, here's a little play on whether this was the garden scene in the fall, or if he's speaking about humanity in general. But we get to there, and all of the things that we were told rule over them, we say, no, I like it better if I worship that thing. Now think about Moses is up on the mountain, he's with God, comes back down. What are they worshiping? Golden calf. Were they told to rule over all of the calves? Yes. The mandate from the beginning of the world was don't bow down to these things. Paul says from the very beginning, we turned and what God told us to do, we flipped it upside down and started putting those things above us. We started choosing the things that will have authority in our life. Anybody have any questions? Put them in the pot. To be continued. To be continued, literally. Over the next few weeks, we will go through some things that now you have laid the foundation. Ask yourself when you get in your small group, maybe when you're driving along the road, do I choose the things that have authority in my life? Yes, you do. Do other things have authority in my life because they do. Simple question. I'm going to pray. I invite Craig and the, the trio back up. And, uh, and we can close out. Spirit, I ask that you would give us grace upon grace upon grace upon mercy, upon compassion, upon understanding, upon every single fruit of the Spirit that we can possibly have at one moment so that we can approach this in a way that simply says... Lord, it's you. 
It's not about me being right. It's not about me being wrong. It's not about us being a certain thing or a certain group, but it's about you speaking to us. So I ask that you would soften those really hard things inside of us and you would make us receptive to hearing your voice. In your powerful name, Jesus, amen.